My name is Yvonne Lobby. I'm with the Poughkeepsie Public Library District and thank you for joining us this evening. Um, I wanted to let you know, or just make sure that a couple of housekeeping things, make sure your volume on your computer or tablet or phone is up so you can hear us. Uh, and, um, you know, we will be starting the show shortly. Uh, if you have any questions, we're going to ask that you wait until the end of the program, uh, by which you can either enter them into the, um, the meeting's chat box how, or unmute yourself at the end and we'll allow people to ask questions directly. Um, this will be recorded and will be added to the library's YouTube channel and uh, probably early next week, we, we can have a, um, a link available. And if anybody's interested, uh, Claudia will add her email address to the chat box. So that way we can uh, make sure that everybody gets a copy or a link to the YouTube channel. Okay, so let me introduce Claudia. Claudia Gorman has been exploring the magic and mysteries of birds throughout her photographic career. Her fascination with birds inspires her to record their mastery of flight, parenting skills, and eccentric behaviors. Claudia points her lens at whatever flies by, from little hummingbirds to huge birds of prey, which as a majestic bald eagle, as well as such as the majestic bald eagle, as well as thousands of crows that gather near the Hudson River in Poughkeepsie as the weather cools off. This exhibit at the uh, Boardman Road Branch Library documents Poughkeepsie's extraordinary crow roost and includes prints on several alternative media such as metal, fabric, and Japanese papers. Gorman has embraced photography as an art, an art form in the late 70s. As a photographer, she believes the click of the shutter is the beginning of a visual journey. Creating the photographic print is as important as taking the picture. Gorman believes the final images reflect her experiences of photographing the crows. Gorman studied photography primarily at the International Center of Photography in New York City and at the Center of Photography in Woodstock. Her prints have been exhibited extensively for over 30 years in solo and group shows internationally and nationally, including here in the Hudson Valley and in New York City. So join me in giving a, a warm Poughkeepsie welcome to Claudia Gorman. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, before we start the slideshow, I, I just gonna quickly try to explain what's going on in Poughkeepsie. I think there's a lot of local people who probably know all this and maybe know more than I do about the crows. But for all of you that just kind of sort of know what's going on, I'll give you a little bit more information. So basically just before dusk during the colder months, a communal winter roost occurs in Poughkeepsie. Thousands of crows from Dutchess and Ulster County and beyond gather near the Hudson River for the night. One reason the roost is so large is because crows from the north migrate to Poughkeepsie. Some people estimate that by December there are 10,000 crows in the roost. This has been happening for decades. These clever animals chatter, socialize, then they hunker down for a night's sleep. At dawn, the chatter starts again and they depart for their daily excursions. But again, each night they return. Reasons are uncertain, but it seems communal roosts minimize the risk of predator attack at night, and perhaps it helps the birds stay warmer in frigid weather. Some speculate that culturally, it's a form of transmission of information. Younger and unskilled crows can learn social wisdom defense efficacy and where to forage by day from the smarter birds. Possibly it's an opportunity to find a mate. When late winter, <clears throat> early spring arrives, the crows scatter far and wide to start families. They become less social and more territorial during nesting season. Um, Yvonne, if you wouldn't mind starting the slideshow.
So that's just a quick introduction to what I spotted one day. I was in Poughkeepsie driving to find the crows. You always have to kind of find them. Um, and these guys, is that me? Oh dear. Sorry, it's actually my son. He always does this. <laughs> God. Um, distraction, I'm sorry. Um, so these crows are coming from Dutchess County and they're going towards the river. Uh, it's about 15 minutes before sunset. And as far as location is concerned, if you know the corner of Franklin and Garfield, that's pretty much where I was. I was driving to go find the crows and I did find them that night. So that was uh, pretty cool. This is just a cell phone. I just got out of the car and uh, took a quick movie. All right. So we could move on on that one. Right now. This is the exhibit at the library. Um, if you have a chance to stop in, it feels pretty safe being there. It's a very large space, there's very few people. Everybody's good about wearing masks, is you know, disinfectant, the whole whatever. I understand if you don't want to, and that's why we're having this discussion. But that's what the exhibit looks like. <clears throat> um, I tend to use a lot of different materials um, in my printing process. For this show, I decided also to send out, to have some metal prints made. And basically what that is, is um, they take my image, they make an inkjet dye sublimation print, and they, I won't say cook it, but they, with heat, they align the print to the metal sheet and they infuse it onto the surface. Um, and I just thought it was appropriate for some of these images. So this is an icy night in Poughkeepsie, and this is a 12 by 12 inch direct print on aluminum diabond, which I, for now on, I'm going just to call a metal print for the others. This was also heading to town. So these crows are coming from the east um, by moonlight. That was just lucky enough to hit the right night for that. Uh, I think this is around Cottage Street. These crows are coming from the opposite direction. They're coming from Ulster County. So I'm sitting in Warreas Park and the sun is setting and all of a sudden it's like, okay, <laughs> they're here. <laughs> and that's sort of how it works with the crows. You're always looking for them. And that's also a metal print. That's quite large. It's 20 by 30 inches. Here we have Metro North, probably recognized, and uh, it's right around sunset. And this is also a metal print. It's a smaller one, it's eight by 10. Now this is a, an archival pigment print. Uh, this is something that I print in my own studio. I have a digital dark room and I have a regular old fashioned dark room, but none of the prints were made down there on this round. Um, these crows, I believe, what they were doing was um, after they chatter with each other in these little sections around Poughkeepsie, they all fly to the roost. Where is the roost? That's a very good question. I think it's different, different years. And I think this year from somebody I was talking to, she told me she thought the roost was near Marist College. So I think these guys are going to the roost because it was getting pretty dark at this point. It was after the sun was down and all the colors come out after the sun sets and I think they were off to the roost. This is just a neighborhood shot. Um, it's an 11 by 14 archival pigment print. And this neighborhood is covered with crow. I mean, I don't know how these people live on this block. It's a little block, I think it's called Pine Street and I frequently find them here. Um, it's near the Hudson River and it's just cool for me, maybe not for the neighbors. And this, this is on, printed on actually 
you'll see the next slide. This is the image. And this one I decided to print on fabric. Um, Yvonne, if you wouldn't mind, yeah. The thing about the crows is I decided to use fabric for a lot of the images because I could, there's motion involved, a little bit of a wind and the, and the, and the piece is moving. So I experimented with a lot of fabrics. This happens to be a, a poly satin material. Um, and appropriately, I put it on a twig. This is a, a larger mural of the crows on fabric. Uh, how big is this? This is 17 by 38. This is one of the larger pieces. And you'll see in the next slide that that's also on a twig, more like a branch. So it does have the opportunity to move around a lot, which is nice, seems appropriate. And this collage is also on fabric, which you'll be able to tell much better in the next slide. It's the biggest one I made. It's 17 by 60 inches. Um, my printer can print as wide as 17 inches. And if you nurture it along a bit, it can print, um, I'm sorry, as wide as 17 inches. And it can, it can print fairly long. 60 inches is the longest I've ever done. So that's what this is. And this is a metal print. So it's just a small, like an eight by 10 oval print of the crows on the move. This is one of my favorite prints actually. Um, this one's an archival pigment print. It's um, on a unique artist paper, which just means that I went to this fancy store in Brooklyn and found all these lovely papers that I loved. And a lot of them were just like one piece of this and one piece of that. And um, I experimented with them. I also did platinum palladium print of this, um, which is another process. I don't wanna get into technical, but um, this is on um, a Japanese paper. It's actually, I guess you call it paper, but it's actually mulberry is what they make it from. So it's a handmade paper from mulberry bush. It's called Kozo paper. And it's just a small print, it's eight by eight. And it's just the crows dancing around in the trees. So this is the staging time before they all go to roost. Another small metal print, it's just eight inches. Uh, this again is on a unique artist paper that I picked up. Um, it's a pigment print and it's, I call this crow silhouettes. These are the crows playing musical chairs. And that's also on the Japanese paper, the Kozo paper. And here they're just flying off the trees. They're just going north, you know. Um, it's a, this is again is a, a mulberry paper. There's just so many crows out there, it's crazy. Uh, this is printed on silk. So it's in a small frame and it has an opportunity to move. We have a slide of that. Um, it's just crows, crows and crows. Uh, this again is on the Mulberry um, Kozo paper. And this was another day that I think they were going off to Marist. So it's right as the sun's going down and they're passing the Mid-Hudson Bridge. That's a 16 by 20 print. This one's a little smaller. It's an 11 by 14 print, same day. This one's a little earlier in the evening, just a little bit. I mean, I basically have about 15, 20 minutes to take these pictures because it gets dark right away by the time they come. So um, it's an interesting challenge. And this, I believe, I can't guarantee it, but I believe this is the crows roosting. This was about an hour after sunset. And I was just so curious to figure out, you know, like, do they stay? Where do they go? What do they do? Um, so I just hung out and this was by Shadows, that restaurant mm -hmm. that many of you might be familiar with in Poughkeepsie on the Hudson River. And there's just all these crows in the trees. And I think they're just down for the night and they'll get up in the morning and they'll, they'll move on. <clears throat> One time I was on the train coming home 
and they were all in the parking lot adjacent. It's not really a parking lot. I don't think people put cars there. It was just an empty lot right adjacent to shadows, all on the ground, all together. And that was clearly the roost for them. So um, I wasn't able to photograph that, but I learned a little something that day. And these, we added, Ruth Wally is the curator of this show, wonderful person who really wanted me to include these larger pictures of these birds, which are kind of related to crows. These are red-winged blackbirds. Um, the red-winged blackbirds and the crows are both in the same family of, and I probably will not pronounce this properly, it's Latin, but the uh, passer, passeriforms. Um, but then when you break down the different groups and families of birds are not quite in the same family, but they are certainly distant cousins. Um, they are also very social animals. And basically uh, one March, my husband and I were walking around in Bard State Park and we saw a whole bunch of birds. Um, I was trying to figure out what was going on. And it turned out that it was the red-winged blackbirds returning, it was migration time, it was in March. So I started stalking them. I was driving on Freedom Road every morning trying to find them. And one day I lucked out on a nice foggy, freezing, rainy morning. They were all in the cornfield. So I went out there and got a few shots of them. So these are two very large archival pi pigment prints, not that large, but they're uh, about 40 inches long, uh, a little bit more than two feet tall. And they're also in the exhibit the crow's cousins. And that's them also in the cornfield. And then what they do is after they feed, it's a long trip from wherever they're coming. I'm not exactly sure where they came from, but they feed together and then they disperse. They go into swamps, they, they, they start mating and um, they're not together anymore. And crows sort of do the same thing. They roost during the cold weather, but after that, they're on their own, you know, they have their own families and they're territorial and it's just like a whole different world for them. So that's what's on the wall. Um, I'd like to share some information with you about the crows. <clears throat> um, I mean, as far as photographing the crows, there's really not much that I can tell you. This all started for me one day when, I think it was the first time I was walking on the walkway over the Hudson. And it was right around before sundown, but it was, it was late in the day. And there's crows all over the place. And I'm like, what's going on? You know, who, what's, who, what, what? So I started looking into it. And then I started noticing that I live in Pleasant Valley and I started noticing a certain time of day if we were driving that we'd see crows traveling west to the river. One thing led to another and the next thing I knew I was, you know, doing the crow project. So just going out there right at that time and trying to find them and photograph them. So um, Scenic Hudson did an article recently that explained some things to me. So I'm just going to read very quickly a small part of it. Um, around sunset, the crows arrive from the Ulster side of the river and gather in staging areas prior to moving to the roost. A staging area is basically a gathering place for the crows located close to the roost. Staging sites can include trees, parking lots, buildings, and much to the dismay of some residents, backyards and houses, since they do leave, ex they excrete a lot and they make a lot of noise. Staging is a boisterous time for crows with a lot of chatter and interaction among the birds prior to roosting. They'll often gather in relatively small groups of 50 to 150, then head out in groups. The staging process is a wonderful thing to watch. So I really appreciated uh, receiving that article in an email. Um, I started researching the crows for obvious reasons, and I'm gonna share some facts with you. <clears throat> They're found everywhere other than the North and South Pole and the Southern tip of South America. Crows are actually very smart, social, caring, and family-oriented creatures. Um, some examples, 
Some young crows will help their parents care for younger siblings until they're old enough to breed themselves. And I'm guessing this is also a learning experience for them. They remember faces and warn other crows about danger, even teaching their nestlings to beware of the danger. I watched quite a few YouTubes and I can't share everything with you because it'll take way too long. But if you're interested in any of this, I can send links to the YouTubes. Most of them are less than five minutes and uh, we all have a little extra time these days with COVID being stuck at home. So you might wanna, uh, that was a YouTube about the, the danger that this, I think it was a PhD program or something that this guy sort of realized what was going on and he wanted to experiment. So he started wearing a mask and going over and scaring the crows. Um, and then they would start screaming their warning signal. The point of what he was trying to do was figure out if the adult crows could teach the nest with three babies, what was going on. And the short story is that when the babies grew up, they did understand if they saw the guys with the mask, they would start screaming the same scream. So even as a, as a mere fledgling, they're already learning from their parents. I also watched a YouTube where a crow had a troubleshoot and perform eight different steps to get a piece of food. So that was pretty crazy. It included stones and tools and, you know, it was just like nuts. Um, they also figured out in Japan how to crack their nuts, believe it or not, by they would take the nuts and they would drop them in the streets or the mopeds and the whatever would crush the nut. They would watch the traffic lights and go pick up the food when the light was red. I mean, these are crows. <laughs> so it's, they're smart. <laughs> there's a YouTube on that too. <laughs> um, and then there's a guy named Joshua Klein who did a TED talk about him. That was a long one. But basically what he did was he, he knew the crows were smart and he was just trying to learn more about them. There's, there's, a, there's something called the, the Skinnerian training technique. And based on that technique, he built a box. Um, it was like a vending machine. And he went through four different steps with the crows. Once they learned one thing, he would go to the next step, went, you know, keep going and going until he got to the point where the crows understood that if they took a coin and put it in the vending machine, a piece of food would come out. So once again, that's on YouTube. And just because I don't wanna keep you guys too, too long, um, I'm not gonna tell you the whole story. But if you wanna know, I have the information. I can email it, I can send the YouTube link, whatever you'd like. Now this one's cute. There was a little girl, <laughs> I love this one. She was feeding her birds in the backyard. She had a little bird feeder and she'd sit out there and she'd watch the birds eat and the crows would eat. At some point, <clears throat> the crows started bringing her gifts. They would fly over with something shiny, drop it down, go to the feeder, take some food and leave. So apparently the crows were stealing, you know, people don't, a lot of people don't like crows. They call them thieves, they call them dirty, uh, you know, they're whatever. So, Apparently the crows were stealing, but they were also being very kind and giving. So the little girl had a whole collection of shiny things that the crows gave her. Another YouTube, of course. They play, they make tools, as I had mentioned. And from what I understand, there's not that many, there's humans, orangutans, chimpanzees, and crows. That's it for making tools. Um, in the wild, they'll find a good stick, they'll sharpen it. Um, they like to make it like a fork so that they can, or a hook, so that they can scoop larvae out of holes. So they get the worms out of holes that they can't possibly get with that, just their beaks. They mate for life. Uh, they recognize the death of another crow, which reminds me, Yvonne, we didn't play the, uh, the last movie. We can play that after. Yeah. Um, I'm almost done, so we'll, we'll put it on after. They gather around a dead crow, perhaps to learn about dangerous places and new predators. Uh, there could be other reasons, but that one I didn't research too hard. Um, predators are owls and red-tailed hawks and raccoons, and I guess they feel a lot safer 
in the roost because they're all together, it's harder for predators to single out a crow that way. Uh, the crow also represents creation and spiritual strength and wisdom. Many Native American cultures consider crows to be the keepers of the spiritual law because nothing escapes their keen sight. They hold the knowledge of all things, including ancient magic. Crows eat just about everything. They're omnivores, so they eat plants and animal food, but they're predators and they're scavengers. So, you know, they have a pretty good diet. Um, they eat roadkill, insects, frogs, snakes, mice, human fast food. Unfortunately, they'll also grab eggs and nestlings from other birds. Farmers consider them pests because they eat fruit and seedlings and crops, but a crow family can eat 40,000 grubs, caterpillars, and army worms in one nesting season. So that's not so bad for a farmer. And one final note, as far as information about the crows, um, they use at least 250 different calls. They have regional dialects, since they are all over the world. Um, and one example would be the distress call, which brings other crows to their aid as crows defend each other. So, um, before you put that movie on, I just want to take a moment to thank all the people at the library. What a wonderful group of people. I had so many people helping me. Ruth Wally is the curator of the exhibits there, and Jeff hung the show, and I just, you know, like hanging these things on the ceiling is kind of scary to watch. He, he has to have everything perfect, and I'm very grateful for that. Um, Yvonne has helped me tremendously with the Zoom project so that you can't tell how deficient I am and how to do this. And then there's Jewel and Julie, just everybody was just so friendly and helpful and wonderful. And I just wanted to make sure that I thank everybody for everything. Um, I think I'm gonna leave it at that and go to some questions because otherwise I'll be talking forever. So maybe we could put that movie on as a grand finale. It's just a quickie. It was supposed to be the intro to my talk, but whatever. And then any questions I can answer if I can. It's quick. This is from PBS, as you can see. Okay, so we'll open it up for questions. If anybody has a question, you can either enter it into the chat box or um, you're welcome to unmute yourself and, and ask Claudia directly. Should I, I should read all this, right? I can read it to you. Most, uh, most of these are praise for your pictures. Oh, thank you, everyone. <laughs> thank you so much. I'll be sure to read all of the comments. Mm -hmm. Um, yes. Claudia. Yes. It's Rich. Hi, Claudia. Hi, Rich. Hi, <laughs> do. do they all roost in one place or do they split yeah. up and roost in, in, in multiple pl places? I think the way it works is the staging is in multiple places. And then mm -hmm. when it's really dark out and they're ready to roost, they're all together. Mm, wow. I'm pretty sure. I mean, when you start researching this stuff, there's not a whole lot of information. So, and Cla mm. Claudia Heights, Diane, what about when they nest and 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 lay their eggs and stuff? Now, where where and when does that happen? So that's going to happen soon, probably you know the end of March, the beginning of April, or something like that. I haven't been to the river lately, but I would I would guess that the roost is smaller starting to peter out because anybody who migrates is probably going back up north. 
The logos right. might still be hanging out together. Um, but once they start nesting, the roost is gone for the season. Oh, yeah, I do. <laughs> Thanks, Claudia. Claudia. Sure. Oh. Thanks for coming. Oh, so oh, good. Hi, Loved it. Hi. Loved it. Uh, first of all, I mean, the photos are, they're, they're just wonderful. I wrote they're magical. They Thank really you. are. And hearing you, you just helped me rewrite part of my history. Yeah, well. From something <laughs> negative to something really positive. When I was five years old, a crow flew onto my shoulder oh. and wouldn't, oh. No one could get it off. And so I always viewed that as a horrible thing. But now I think it's a wonderful thing. Mm -hmm. No, actually, that's true, Ruth, because if yeah. I can send you a link about I was reading about spiritual crows and everything. And that's, uh oh. Hang on, guys. I lost my Zoom. There you are. I guess oh, I can't hear you. Can hear me? <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, we can hear you. You disappeared or I disappeared. Um, one of the things I read was that that's really supposed to be good luck. That's a really good thing. So no way for a child to know. But, you know, when I was a little girl, I was out playing and a bee landed on my chest and I was terrified. But my mother had always told me, you know, don't run. They'll sting you. So I stood there like, a, you know, forever with this bee on my chest. And I was terrified of bees until I, you know, now I'm a gardener. So I, it took me years to get over that. So I get it with the crow. Yeah, but no more now. <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. But where are their nests? Claudia, I think Carol uh, Lozides has a question. We can hear you, Carol. What do, you, do you have a yeah, question? Yeah, I did. I did have a question. Oh, it's not, sort of a question, but it's, it's a comment. Um, I uh, worked at social services right up the road for about 14 years. And at that time of the year that you mentioned, these were always my, they always accompanied me to my car. And it, it just made leaving work even better. <laughs> uh, I never understood, I never realized how many there were. Love that they were there year after year. Mm, the brothers when they come. And it was just an experience. And yeah. I used to call them the commuter crows. But now I have a lot uh, more information about what this was all about. Yeah. But that was my name for them. Because I thought, well, they've been working all day and now they're going home just when <laughs> I am. And hopefully not decorating your car too much. <laughs> One day I got Not back to my car no, and I was were, like, they oh were down my by, goodness. <laughs> by the river. They Not at all. No, they were down by the river. That's good. So you have another question from Jeep Johnson and asking, how long do the crows live? Where are you, Jeep? Um, I don't know. I don't know the lifespan of a crow. I'll look it up and let you know. There you are. What's Hi, the Jeep. lifespan of a crow? I just asked Google to see what they say. Okay, what'd they say? I don't know yet. Diana, okay, no, no, I'd like to know. Thinking about it. Yeah. Wasn't it true oh, yeah. that- uh, I thought the images look fabulous. Thank I you. Thought, Thank you. Eight to 10 years. Yeah. I talked to Lynn eight James to today years. and she said she saw the show in person and she could, I don't think she could make it tonight. Lynn, I don't think you're on, but she said the show looked absolutely fabulous. Oh, great. And, Congratulations. Thank you. Go girl. All right. <laughs> <laughs> it's supposed to be, it's a legend that a, a crow landed on Da Vinci's, Leonardo Da Vinci's crib when he was a two or three or something like that. So good luck. Good luck mm -hmm. and good, good for artists. Yeah. Yeah. I, spiritually, they really have a good reputation, especially with the Native American Indians. Hi, Meadow. I'm just seeing occasional faces. I'm not really sure how this works. It's just the faces change. <laughs> I have a, Hello, uh, everyone. How's that? <laughs> I have a comment. I, I can't see myself. So um, my name's Naomi Tepich. 
Hi, Naomi. I'm Hi. trying to find you. You're here somewhere. I know I saw your name somewhere, but well, go ahead. It doesn't matter. All right. Well, um, I'm from, I, I live near the Delaware River and we have a lot of eagles there. And um, specifically to my property, sometimes um, we see an eagle surrounded by crows um, kind of defending themselves or trying to ward away the eagle. Um, do you have any information on, on that subject? Well, I don't know what time of year it is, but the first thing that comes to mind is they're probably protecting their young. Mm -hmm. Is it, does it happen to be in the spring that you notice it or it's just any time? I think I noticed it in the summer and maybe in the fall. I'm not sure. It could have been the spring. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm not, now that you mentioned it, I'm not sure how you, certain birds nest many different times. They have, um, I've noticed that on my own property, you know, I think it only happens in the spring and then I find in July there's another nest with three eggs. So it could have a lot to do with just taking care of their family and not trusting the eagle for very good reason. Okay. And a lot of times you might notice if you look up in the sky, you'll see a bunch of little birds chasing one big bird. Um, that's what that's all about. They're, they're protecting their nests. I see uh Dan Quinajon raised his hand. Do you have a question, Dan? Yes, just a kind of a question and a comment. I caught the very tail end of this. Um, I, I have to play catch up. I don't know if, oh, you did record the presentation. So we I'm gonna recording. catch back up. So I just had, I've, I've had a, a really interesting relationship with, with crows and ravens in our family. We're part Native American. And if I could just share my, my family story. Oh, I would, I would love to hear that, family. yes. So my great great grandmother was a full blood full blood Ute Indian, um, and living at the time in the Monument Valley areas of Utah, where the indigenous Utes lived. Um, so as colonization of of the Mormon factions moved into, you know, the Department of Utah, uh, she and her family were forced out. And as the stories was told and passed down to us how she managed with her, her other members of her tribe and family to, to make it eventually to safe haven was because ravens and crows would, I, it just chokes me up whenever I tell this story, ravens and crows would be on the path. Mm -hmm. And they knew that if they followed the ravens and crows, they would be safe. I so, believe it. I totally, so growing I mean, up, yeah. yeah, growing up, it was always, um, my grandmother said never, you know, because you'd hear them cawing and making noise and dropping walnuts on the house. And, you know, why are they so destructive? And my grandmother would always scold me. And she said, no, no, if it wasn't for them, you wouldn't be here. Mm -hmm. So we, we have a very, very big love in my family for crows. And, and uh, like you, I've, I've become um, quite a fan of them. And there are a family of crows that now greet me at lunchtime. They recognize my truck. And they know I've got crackers or something else, and they they come and see me. So it's a good time. Yeah, but, I believe it. Uh, I, yeah, I am really encouraged by your work, and um, I, I thank you for for what you do. Thank you. You know, when I go outside, when there's crows out, I always say hello to them, and you know, I think it's my imagination, but they answer me. Oh yeah. Now, when my husband and I were in Yellowstone in June, which is uh, spring for them. The ravens were so friendly. It was crazy. And they would talk to us and mm -hmm. it was just lovely. I got lots of closer pictures of ravens just, you know, showing off and being beautiful and <laughs> fabulous. You know, I love birds. I'm crazy about birds. I don't know. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> well, thank you for sharing that. That's wonderful. Thank you. Ravens are big crows. Well, they're in the same family. Um, we got ravens, believe it or not, blue jays are in that family. Let's see, of course, I don't remember, but let's see. Um, crows, ravens, rooks, magpies, and blue jays are all in the Corbidae family. The, the ravens look <laughs> like crows, except they do, they're just a little bigger. Yeah, yeah they look a lot like crows. Yeah, I know I could look this up myself, but it's Stacy, but um. 
I always thought that that they were starlings, those, the, you know, crows that they come with so many of them and they make the sound. Um, but I don't even know what a starling is. So I guess I should look that up. Well, a starling is a small black bird. I mean, small compared to a crow. And they do hang out together. Um, I don't know that they roost. They might. But where are you seeing them? Because you're, you're in Ulster County, so you could very well be seeing the crows flying over to Poughkeepsie. It's possible, yes. Yeah. Um, yep. Uh, so now I'll-, I'll so Now you have to get out your binoculars. Yes. <laughs> and see what you're looking at, first of all. And we'll take it from there and figure out the mystery. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Hi, Ruth Wally here. Hi, Ruth. Hi, Claudia. This yes. is magnificent. We're enchanted with your presentation. Oh, thank you. Your artwork oh, is magnificent. And I wanted to also mention that Dan's story, I hope that he sends that to me. I'd like to pass it on to the library for a different reason, but it's a wonderful, wonderful family story as well. Dan, um, perhaps yes, you could, send that. could you send that <laughs> to the library? Um, and, and I'd be happy name? to share. Sure. Um, just. My name uh, is Ruth. I'm sorry. My name is Ruth Wally. So, um, if you can get in touch with me um, through the library, I would be delighted because Do Claudia. You have an email, Ruth, that you can put into the chat. Uh, if I know how. You know. <laughs> you know what? Let me make it easier for both of you. If, Claudia, and if it, you yeah. contact me, I will send it to Ruth. Oh, thank you. It, it'll oh, be okay, you. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you. That. This was an awesome presentation. Ruth. Thank you. I, uh, I used to watch the crows and I never knew all of this. Driving along Route 9, coming south from, let's say, Rhinebeck, um, at about the time that the sun was getting ready to set, all these crows would be sitting on the wires near the railroad track. So I always felt, oh, they must be looking for warmth. And I never knew more than that. And this has enlightened me and I'm sure many other people on the whole story. It's just wonderful. I'm glad that I could share it. And I learned Thank a lot you. more about crows because I had to do a presentation. So it worked out well. Right. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> We are just so happy that you are exhibiting at the library. Well, thank, thank you, Ruth. You Thanks so for much. putting it together. It was your uh, it's idea. A, it's a joy to work with you and so many of the other artists that have. And there's Basha, who was also a joy. But everyone, it's just delightful to do this. And I hope that many of the people that come to the library enjoy it as well. So do I. And it is wonderful that you have the YouTubes on the library website. If anybody wants any information, just email me and I will be sure to give you the links that you need. Um, I watched Ruth Basha Nelson's YouTube because I missed her presentation and it was wonderful. And there's a whole bunch of other ones there as well. So just wanted to add that. Any questions? Any more questions? Hey, Claudia, I have a question. Who is that, Nestor? Mm -hmm. How are you, Claudia? I'm good. How are you doing? I'd like yes, to see this image. Um, I was not able to attend it earlier, your presentation, but um, I am very glad that you did my cross. I <laughs> love the cross in Poughkeepsie. The whole state of mind for me, of driving in the afternoon. Oh, yeah. Bridge, or just going home, taking Route 9 down, the sound and the flying it's so beautiful it is so have you yeah. noticed are they still there now because i know you're right in poughkeepsie uh they are they are still well, there they, they're more um, crowds than than other times but they, they're always there and yeah. the town it's so beautiful it's just it's another state it's another thing that characterizes poughkeepsie downtown the crowd yeah. going down you know, to, to the river. So it's beautiful. And thank you for doing this. The, the pictures are, I had to stop by and see it, but the picture that I'm seeing in right now, it's amazing. It's like a symphony. You know, it's My pleasure. The, those rhythms of uh, the flying of the animal. So, uh, so beautiful animal. I love it. Yeah, but, they're very special. So my website has a small, uh, 
portfolio of crow pictures. Hopefully I'll be able to get them all on there. I just have to get the chance to do it. I'm gonna try to do it soon. Um, oh. Yeah, get them all on there. That's great. Maybe since Nestor um, didn't have a chance to see it, if it's not too much trouble, Yvonne, if you put the picture of the, the library, you can sure. just get an idea. Let me get that going. I think it's well, like, you know, in the beginning there somewhere. I don't know if thank you for yeah. doing that. And he told me that you record it, so I will check it out the whole yeah. time. Yeah, I'll send a link out to the YouTube um, yeah. as soon as it's available. Oh, beautiful. So this, this is the exhibit, yeah. Yeah. It's small, but it, it yeah, tells yeah, the yeah. story. This is a too big. Yeah. Beautiful. I love the green, the, the background, the, it's so cheerful too, the, that part of the library, I love it. All right. Very nice. Thank, thank you. you, Claudia. Well, thank you everybody for joining me today. Thank you, thank you Claudia. Thank you, Claudia. Yeah. Love you, Claudia. Claudia. And again, thank you to the staff at the library for making this happen. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you Claudia. Thanks so thank much. You. Yeah. All right. Have a good bye. evening, everybody. Bye, bye. bye Claudia. Bye. And I'll be sure to read all the chats. Okay. <laughs> good night. Good night. Bye, good night. Bye,